You know, I am very excited to welcome Dr. Jalan White Newsom to our community today. I saw her give an interview on TV in January and almost immediately contacted her because I admire her knowledge about climate change, her work on climate justice, and her ability to communicate complicated ideas in an engaging way. That trifecta of knowledge, communication skills, and the ability to be engaging is rare. And I hope that Dr. White Newsom will inspire each of you to keep developing those three qualities. So listen carefully to what she says. And if you have any questions, write them down and ask her. And if we run out of time, just email your additional questions to me. And if it's okay with Dr. White Newsom, she'll hopefully be able to answer them for you. Dr. White Newsom is passionate about people, the environment and justice. She's a problem solver whose experience spans multiple disciplines and places. Most recently, she returned as the CEO to the company she founded called Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, LLC. Prior to this, she spent five years as a senior program officer at the National Kresge Foundation and worked there on sustainable water resources management in a changing climate, among other things. She's published many articles and has remained an adjunct professor at George Washington University in the School of Public Health. Throughout her career, she's managed large teams, given more than 100 speeches across the country, trained and taught people of all ages, and served on multiple boards and committees. She's not afraid to disrupt norms and seems, from what I gather, fearless of tough challenges. She earned a PhD from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a Master of Science in Environmental er Engineering from Southern Methodist University, and a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Northwestern University. We are thrilled to welcome her here today as our first Earth Week speaker for 2021. So without further ado, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. You good? All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that introduction. It's just like, I hate kind of like hearing about myself. So I'm like sitting over here cringing, but um, I appreciate the invitation, Dr. Ricker, and the invitation just to have a conversation with you all. So um, I have a couple of slides, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to, you know, spend a little bit of time just giving you a little bit of context and perspective, but then I want to hopefully have enough time for us to have a conversation. And I encourage you, as I encourage all my students, um, use the chat, you, I mean, write down, I mean, let's make this as engaging as possible in the virtual space. Um, so with that, I'm going to attempt to share my slides and get started and uh, hope that we will make it happen. So can everybody see that? See my slide? Oh, awesome. All right. Well, of course, this like allows me not to see you all, but um, we'll get going. So first of all, uh, when I start out these conversations, particularly around environment, um, I have to recognize the place that I'm calling from. So I'm in southeastern Michigan, a little bit outside of Detroit, where I grew up. And we, our home is situated on the original lands of the Potawatomi. And why that's important, and I don't know if this is something that um, you all have talked about in school, but essentially we know that uh, there were folks taking care of this land way before we got here that were stewards of the land, of our air and water, and managing what I would say our earth in a much better way than we have been managing it. So I think it's important as we have these conversations, not only during Earth Week, but every day, which is Earth Day to me, that we recognize that we are stewards of the earth and uh, there were folks here before us and also recognizing our elders and the folks that have paved the way for us to be here. So not only just in terms of the earth, but in terms of me just being even in the position and the opportunities, um, I give credit to my parents, my grandparents and uh, my elders way before me. So again, I encourage you to Bamie, understand uh, where you come from and what lands have been stolen from Native peoples. And to remember to think about uh, recognizing that when you, again, talk and speak for different audiences. So with that, you know, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about, again, uh, you know, kind of my perspective on things. And I think that can only come from my story. But I also want to share with you a couple of things that I think are super important because um, you all are creating your legacy now. 
And some of the things that I definitely wasn't thinking about in high school, and maybe you all are because you seem way ahead of me, is the importance of people, power, and privilege and how you can begin to build your legacy now and what that really means in this space of environmental protection, sustainability, and justice. And so, um, you know, I want to first just acknowledge that um, from what I can see, <laughs> you all are doing some great stuff. And um, just even your mission in terms of being socially aware leaders and just you know, just the, the weight of the things that you're doing. So it's not just education, but you are literally taking it to the streets and taking it to the Capitol. So I just want to recognize that that is awesome and recognize your teachers and your mentors for making education real for you. And so know that what I'm offering, I think, and I hope will only complement uh, the stuff that you're doing so far. And so, you know, uh, Dr. Richter talked about, you know, a little bit of where I've been, but and this is kind of like my visual resume. And, and the reason I'm putting this up is not to just, you know, throw all this stuff at you, but is to share a couple of things. One is that all of these different experiences have added up to where I'm at now. And I think that's important as you talk about environmental protection and sustainability and justice, because the more perspectives, the more uh, opinions, the more feedback you get from a diverse set of folks, the better solutions that you come up with. So I will say when I started out as an engineer, um, the curriculum that we had was not focused on people at all. It was about producing this batch of product or getting out this many widgets and the mass balances and the heat transfer equations that you needed to do that. But as I went along this trail, like if you start in the left-hand corner and follow that little crazy blue line, I learned that a lot of the stuff that I aspire to do, whether it was with a company or on my own, I had to prioritize people. And so the, regardless of where I sat, whether it was in professional industry, uh, in government, you know, in academia, you know, or advocacy, keeping people first and centered was critically important. And that's something that I just love and I think we should emphasize even more. And so, you know, really I would say my, my crush on the environment or when I really started to get into this was really in elementary school. And I have a 12 and a 14 year old now and they tease me oftentimes that, yes, I was, you know, what they used to call a tree hugger or a nerd way back in the day. But I would tell you that passion for the environment um, started with science fair projects. And I was testing water in the Rouge River, which has always been a historically contaminated river that runs through Detroit and other areas in southeastern Michigan. But fast forwarding in high school, I had the opportunity to be a part of this Dow Touch Tech mentoring program. And the whole goal was to get more African-American students into engineering. And um, they wanted to give folks experiences during the summer to do that. And so, you know, I went to Midland, Michigan, which is a couple hours away. And, you know, I was real excited on my own. I think I was a sophomore in high school and I was excited about learning about engineering in the field and all this great stuff. But in addition to that, I ended up learning about the importance of people or the lack thereof sometimes in corporate America. And what it was, there was this program called uh, Responsible Care. And essentially, this was a program that, again, that many corporations had kind of, uh, you know, utilized as a framework for when they do business in certain communities, that they are actually taking care of that community. So they're kind of going above and beyond producing. But what I learned that summer, and I started to ask some questions and dig into it, is that many of the things that we were producing at Dow Chemical, chemicals, herbicides, et cetera, um, they had to travel on trucks and rail uh, through communities to get to their next destination. And unfortunately, most of those trucks and rails <laughs> traveled through low-income communities, communities of color, and they actually end up having more accidents in these places where it was typically your same folks, your black and brown folks, your low-income folks. And, and that was not just a happenstance. The system was set up that way. And so when I began to kind of question that and inquire, like, why is it that these same communities are at risk, you know, for transporting these hazardous chemicals, 
I began to see that that wasn't the only question that I needed to ask and that this wasn't just a phenomenon in Midland, Michigan. And so the second picture shows a picture of the church where I grew up in Detroit. And this just happens to be the home church of the late great Aretha Franklin. And unfortunately this community, again, which was one of the pivotal communities during the civil rights movement, actually Dr. Martin Luther King uh, came and spoke at our church, you know, all this stuff. It, it, it's actually a community where we have some of the, the highest health disparities in the city of Detroit and particularly our babies being exposed to lead. And if you don't know, again, lead is something that, you know, used to be in gasoline, but it's also found in homes. It's hazardous. You can get it off paint chips on window seals. But what it does is that it, 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 it really retards the development delay of, of young folks. And when I say young folks, I mean like your three to four year olds. And so, you know, one of the challenges that we saw and continue to see not only in Detroit, but in Baltimore and other, other places is that, you know, there's always this kind of confluence of, of poverty and access and exposure to hazardous things. And, and lead was something that, uh, again, was really affecting the populations at our church. But then a couple blocks away, when I, again, in high school, I was starting to drive and, you know, I had an opportunity to, you know, grocery shop for my great aunts. And my great aunt actually lives a block away from this last picture, this grocery store that used to be a grocery store. She is 103 year old, three years old, still lives by herself, super spunky. But what was challenging was that she would ask me to go to the grocery store and, and literally I would have to drive probably like 20 miles away to get to a decent grocery store that would actually have, I don't know, fresh fruit that you would wanna eat, that would have meat or chicken that wasn't like yellow or brown, you know, just basic good stuff, right? And so as you think about, again, the, the challenges and the risk and the vulnerabilities that I saw just in my community and in Midland, again, it was not like, you know, something that wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a kawinky dink is what I like to say. And so even building on what I saw and witnessed in Michigan, I took that to Chicago with me when I went to undergrad. And um, I was one of those crazy scientists that love science, but I also love to write. So I actually majored in journalism as well. And there was numerous environmental issues on the south side of Chicago in terms of lead smelters and just highways and air emissions, all this crazy stuff going on. And so what I tried to do was really um, amplify the environmental injustices that were going on on the south side of Chicago. And so I came down from my little engineering school. Of, of course, all the journalists thought I was crazy, an engineer that liked to write. And my story ended up getting on the front page of the Northwestern Daily. And it was speaking to environmental injustice that, again, this had never been in the eyes of, of the folks, the editors uh, at the Northwestern Daily. But again, it was amplifying this issue that was going on from our little wonderful town in Evanston, Illinois, you know, maybe about a couple, you know, 50 miles away that was impacting not only the South Side, but many of the students that came from the South Side of Chicago. But of course, we were pretty privileged and protected in Evanston. Nothing like that ever touched us. But again, it just spoke to the fact that this environmental injustice was something that wasn't just in Detroit, uh, it was a little bit everywhere. And so I, I say all that to say is that when you think about maybe the communities you have grown up in, maybe the countries that you're from, is that, you know, all these things that we're seeing, and, and I know you're aware of this, is that it, it's not just, again, happenstance. It's, it's linked to racism. And, you know, I work, I do a lot of work in other countries, uh, particularly Canada, where, you know, racism is, is less the, the, the root cause, but it's more social inequities or gender inequities, but whatever way you put it, you know, there is something going on within our institutions and our systems that, that keeps certain folks down, that, that uh, you know, again, uh, you know, unfortunately um, put folks at a disadvantage. And, and some of those disadvantages, of course, lead to health concerns and, and ultimately lead to a reduced quality and quantity of life that we all deserve. So I'm going to say here in America, definitely, as folks have been naming, not just in the past year with these uprisings, but have been naming for decades the, the root causes of many of our institutional failures, 
for folks not only in Detroit, but in other communities is connected and rooted in racism. And so this connection, again, is nothing that is new. Um, there was this wonderful article in the Washington Post uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, I encourage you to check it out, that really documented the, the history and the timeline and, and really, I would say, uplifted some of the founding fathers and mothers of environmental justice and environmental racism. And so as we think about what that looks like, whether we say environmental racism, climate injustice, whatever, is that pollution, displacement, the lack of enforcement, the lack of accountability, all these pieces, COVID are connected to health, climate and racism. All of this stuff is connected. And, and so when we talk about solutions, we can't just think about, okay, well, I'm just gonna deal with the dirty air. No, you can't just deal with the dirty air because people don't experience impacts or what I like to call environmental insults in silos. I bet you, you could go to any community and they are being plagued by several of these things at the same time. So as you think about your solutions and as you go out into the real world and you advocate, make sure that your solutions are intersectional and that you're really looking at the profile, the vulnerability profile of whatever community that you're trying to target. So you are addressing the issues or the historic ramifications of redlining. You're looking at you know, COVID rates. You're looking at, again, inadequate infrastructure. So all these pieces, again, are super important and just validate that this is nothing new <laughs> and it's about time to solve it. So as we think about, and as you think about how we can even begin to tackle this huge problem, you know, I could have made a list of 20 things here, but I was really trying to think about, okay, so what, what do I think has driven the transformation that I've tried to, to, to really make move in these different sectors and fields? And I would say ultimately it's prioritizing people, it's applying your power and acknowledging your privilege. So I'm gonna start with prioritizing people because that's where I think we should all start. And so this same community that I talked about on uh, my church community, when I came back, uh, I think it was from Maryland the first time, um, again, there were the, the, the same health disparities we were seeing again, um, higher rates of heart disease and diabetes, um, you know, lead poisoning in our children, the list could go on and on. And so what my mom and I decided to do was to really create an environmental health fair at our church that had never happened before to begin to one, look at the people that were being impacted and make those connections for them. You know, when you talk about the importance of communication, um, oftentimes people don't know that oh my gosh, my asthma, you know, maybe it's just me or it's generational. No, it's being triggered by the fact that you have these crazy pollution sources in your community that by waiting at the bus stop to go to school, you're being exposed to and that's making you more vulnerable. So it, it might seem simple to us folks that, you know, might be immersed in this, you know, environmental, you know, kind of education and knowledge all the time. But for regular folks, making that connection is huge. One, so they, they know what's going on, but two, so they can know really what to do about it and if they can mitigate the impact. So to me, again, giving people, uh, you know, kind of that knowledge and education is so critical. But then the personal piece, you know, again, you know, hit me hard because, um, you know, oh my gosh, probably like 10 or 15 years ago when I came back to Michigan, um, I became the primary caregiver for my grandparents, which they're, this is my favorite picture of them because my Nana used to really never smile too much. And this is the one where I caught her smiling. Um, they both transitioned to heaven now, but I took care of them in their eighties and nineties. And as I was taking care of them, you know, for some reason it started getting hot. <laughs> and I don't know, like it's always gotten hot in different places, but we started experiencing more extreme heat. And what that does for certain populations is definitely put their health at risk. And so for my grandparents, I noticed that they wouldn't turn on the air conditioning. They wouldn't turn on a fan. They would literally be sweating and not really realize they were sweating. And part of that was because of the medications that they were on. Part of that was because they were experiencing the onsets of dementia and Alzheimer's, a whole bunch of different things. They didn't want to pay their energy bill because it was super high if they turned the AC on and then their, their arthritis. So all these different things 
that put them more at risk for this climate impact that they were experiencing. But it wasn't just my grandparents. It was many of their neighbors who had lived in this community for 50 plus years. It was the fact that their neighborhood really didn't have too many trees. It was concrete. It was the fact that their home was over 50 years old and wasn't properly weatherized. And so again, you know, they weren't protected from the ambient. And, and so when you think about all these different factors that, that really increase the vulnerability of people, Again, you begin to see the injustices because in a community not far uh, from where my grandparents lived and where their neighbors lived, the situation was different. Uh, you know, there were more trees, there were more things to kind of reduce the urban heat island effect. The fact that, you know, when you have concrete and hot, it, it makes it hotter. Um, so again, I, I really started through my dissertation research, which was really the driver for my research, was my grandparents. Uh, was to really make this connection between, you know, there is this, this community and this infrastructure that's not decreasing their vulnerability. And then what are the ways that we need to change that? And again, I realized that this was not just a Detroit problem. This was everywhere. And so as you think about solutions and, and really thinking about, okay, so what can be done? You know, the, the, the failure of our infrastructure, going back to that previous slide, is critical. And so Infrastructure is not just pipes and physical stuff you can see. It's also the infrastructure of our healthcare system, the infrastructure of our social service organizations, all these different infrastructures that we rely on, but oftentimes are not well resourced, are not really understanding of some of the impacts from climate change and other things. And so this was something that I studied across the country, particularly local health departments that are in many cases is the frontline responders as we're seeing with COVID. But the fact that many of our local health departments have not been funded for so long, or nor do they have someone that focuses on justice or climate change, and sometimes don't even have someone that focuses on community engagement and education, that is a concern. So, so that is a huge need, you know, to really shore up the infrastructures that we're dependent on. And so again, it's like, I can't get away from this because for the past couple of years, I've been kind of this, this pseudo lawyer for my parents who have unfortunately experienced flooding. And it wasn't from some big hurricane. It was interstitial flooding or flooding that happens in cities um, from a hard, hard rain. And again, with climate change, we're gonna continue to see increased flooding we're gonna see not only increases in frequency, but the intensity of flooding. And this has played out again, I'll speak from my experience in Detroit and other places, but these are pictures of my parents' basement. Their last flood happened a week before Christmas in 2020. So they were displaced for a month. They lived with us for a little while. But I bring this up again, because of the lack of infrastructure that is in place to support not only Again, low-income folks, communities of color that have experienced environmental insults or climate extremes, but also <laughs> when it comes to the health side of it. So when flooding happens in your basement, oftentimes it could be a combination of sewer, so combined sewer overflows, so actually sewer, sewer stuff coming up from your basement, the stuff you flush in the toilet, but it can also be the rain mixed into that. But regardless, there are so many communities across Detroit and across this country that suffer from this combined sewer over flood, over flooding happening in their basements. And again, the disparities that we continue to see are driven by institutional and structural racism, driven by the fact that no one is being held accountable and driven by the fact that, you know, our systems are not really prioritizing people. Because I don't know if you know, but when you think about the things that happened uh, as a result of Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, there were certain folks and communities that were able to recover fairly quickly. You know, they either had a home somewhere else or they could go out of state to someone and stay with them for a little while. They had, you know, money kind of, you know, somewhere where they could kind of rebuild quickly. This is not the case for most regular folks. Um, you know, and there's these, these processes that, that cities and governments set up that folks have to go through to get compensated or, you know, or get relief that oftentimes, again, are just, they have many barriers in place that make it hard for folks to fill out the forms or to follow up or to get legal support. 
And so again, you see this not only in Detroit, that the disparities, uh, that the failures in the infrastructure lead to mental health challenges and physical health challenges for many folks. Again, I'm focused on flooding here, but you can relate this to anything. Because when you think about the fact that when folks are environmentally insulted multiple times, whether it's recurrent flooding, whether it's you know losing your power multiple times, that brings trauma. And, and, and again, when you don't get the relief or you're not able to bounce back or even bounce forward appropriately, um, when we talk about the impacts of mental health, which is something that we don't talk enough about that we're just kind of talking about now with COVID, but think about it from a climate perspective. These are things that unfortunately, you know, again, happen on or happen to our low-income communities, our communities of color, and our indigenous peoples. So the other piece that I want to speak to is applying your power. And oftentimes I talk about this, you know, as we all, each one of us here today have superpowers, right? So we might not be able to, you know, pick up a truck with one hand or move a mountain, but we still have powers within us that can, again, help us achieve environmental and climate justice and address health disparities. And I, I really think about and reflect on my time in Washington, D.C., where I was the director of federal policy for a community-based environmental justice organization. And what was crazy was that this was the first time that there had been an environmental justice office from a community-based organization in Washington, D.C. Now that might not seem like a big deal, but if you know D.C., having a presence there is important. So all of the big organizations, all of the national non-government non-governmental environmental organizations all have offices in DC because their presence on the Hill, their presence in front of these agencies is super critical. So when we brought this office to DC, it was a big deal. And we realized that, oh my gosh, like we need to figure out how to use our power. And in this case, our power was really our voice. It was our ability to convene it was our ability to bring folks and stories together from, together from across the country that have been working on environmental injustices in their own community to take a stand and, and protest and say, hey, you know, what you're suggesting or planning or the policy that you're trying to put forward is inadequate. You haven't done the proper equity analysis to see how this is going to impact my community in New Mexico. And so part of what we did was, again, really harness our power as a people and our collective voice to actually change the outcome of one of the premier climate policies um, during the Obama administration, which was the Clean Power Plan, which the goal was to reduce the emissions from coal-fired power plants, but again, do that in a way that spurred renewable energy and not all these crazy unintentional consequences. So this, this concept of power uh, is huge. And I say that because when you talk about, again, having voice, um, being able to educate and train those that need to know and understand the impacts on communities, that's something we, we definitely try to do as well. And so again, part of our power is our knowledge and our experiential knowledge, which again, in some cases is, is undervalued, but as you're seeing, you know, it is just as valuable or sometimes even more. So book knowledge coupled with experience is a powerful thing. And so we try to, you know, pretty much train, uh, you know, our elected officials at the federal level, at the state level, you know, we, we kind of schooled them on what engagement really means, <laughs> what meaningful engagement really means and how you do it. And a lot of that came from actually bringing our voices together. And so this other picture on the left-hand side is the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, which is really a result of some funding that I gave to, to a couple of organizations, Policy Link and the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, because there was not a voice for Black and Brown and Indigenous folks around water equity uh, that was a national voice that could really move and get into policy at the federal level. And so basically uh, now, you know, it, it's been around for a couple of years now, and they have probably 90 plus communities represented in this national caucus that were really instrumental in many of the things that you're seeing coming out of this current administration. So again, 
the power of voice is critical. But I also want to tell you about the power of data. And again, I can totally nerd out, but this was a project that uh, we supported for Groundwork USA. And maybe you've heard of them, but basically they're a national organization, really, I would say youth led and then complemented by other you know, local and county leaders that work on environmental issues, equity issues, economic development, a whole bunch of issues. I encourage you to look them up. But this particular project is the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Project. And what I think is so cool is that they have created this, this powerful use of data, historical redlining data, to the fact that, again, with redlining, you know, certain communities uh, were redlined or they were deemed bad and not investable. And particularly, these were the communities that immigrants and people of color were forced to live in too long time ago. But they've overlaid these redlining maps with the places where they're seeing recurrent flooding, like now, and then recurrent, you know, heat waves, like now, to really show the different levels of vulnerability. But then this is a tool that those communities and those youth can use to advocate to bring resources and solutions and, and whatever else into these specific areas. So they, they've created these maps for different communities across the country, just by, again, using the power of data. But what's also, what's also cool is that they are complementing the quantitative data in the GIS analysis, the geographic information system analysis with community voice and community stories. And so again, the power that we have in our voice and, and how we share data and tell our stories is so critical to advancing environmental and climate justice. So the last piece I'll talk about is privilege. Now, I don't want you to think privilege is a bad thing, right? We all have some type of privilege just based on the groups we belong to, the identities we hold, you know, maybe where we grew up and all that stuff. But what I will say is that Privilege can be bad, but it can also be good if you use it for good. And so the privilege that I had being at the Kresge Foundation, uh, again, a national foundation, been around for almost 100 years, um, was that I was able to give out millions of dollars to organizations that were doing great work. And so when I got into that position, you know, my <laughs> personal agenda because I had been on the other side as a grant seeker was to figure out why there were such this huge disparities in funding that was going to black and brown and woman led indigenous led organizations versus white led organizations. Like you, I mean, there's numerous reports out there but basically little crumbs were going to these black and brown led organizations versus the gazillions of dollars going to these white led organizations that were working on many of the same things. And so my goal was when I got, again, this opportunity was to try and disrupt that and change that. And so one of the initiatives that I'll speak to, and I, and I was a part of building another one, was the Climate Resilient and Equitable Water Systems Initiative. And one of the things that was super critical was that this was not just going to be some grant program where I give out some money and, okay, see you later, and hopefully you'll do some decent work. No, the goal was to change hearts and minds, to really understand what equity means in the water space and what is your role, whether you're a utility leader, whether you're a community-based organization, whether you're an elected, what does equity mean in the decisions that you make every day and how do you begin to transform the places that you're in? And so we had members, uh, well, grantees that again, covered you know, many areas across the United States, again, all working at different levels. But what was so cool was that we really tried to transform the water system in a way where, you know, no one could not say that they didn't understand the connections between water and equity and that they didn't understand how they couldn't use their privilege to actually advance the things that we were trying to push. So the fact that everybody deserved clean and affordable water, the fact that no one deserved to have their basement flooded over and over again. The fact that green stormwater infrastructure as a nature-based solution had multiple benefits for health and for communities and that we should figure out a way that everybody could afford it. So again, using this privilege of being in philanthropy and being in this position to dole out funds, 
you know, my, I, I attempted to, again, transform a system that in many ways had worked against many folks um, for so, so long and continues to this day. Another initiative that I want to share at the Kresge Foundation that um, was really a part of the core team to develop was around climate change, health and equity. And so at this intersection, what is, I mean, what, what really was the goal of institutions and practitioners and community-based organizations in building climate resilience in communities across this country? Again, as you think about that, the other slide and, and the failed infrastructure, you know, we have had institutions fail us for a long time. We have had, in some cases, practitioners fail us because they haven't seen the connections. And the fact that we haven't amplified and supported our community-based organizations and advocates has been critical. So part of this initiative has been to align these different bodies of folks working for climate resilience, but do it in a way where it is grounded in deep principles of equity and what that really means in the positions and the, and the privilege that they hold. So again, I think again, this all leads to what I'm doing now. And you know, transformation is something that has been critical and you know, again, a part of my life. And, and now I'm able to kind of do that outside of an institutional box and really have fun in different spaces and places where I want to land. So, you know, again, I am having the opportunity through my consultancy to work on many different issues with many different partners and friends, but with the goal of pushing them to do better and to challenge themselves and to actually be in service to the communities that they're supposed to be. And so what I would just say to you, as you all continue as students and you go on to continue to do great things, you know, thinking about your legacy, I want you to remember the people, your power, your privilege. And so what I often say is, you know, you cannot go wrong by centering people in your solution, that it is your role to amplify those that seem to be in, invisible and not important. And when you think about the basic human rights that you want, you know, clean water, safe home, safe place to live. That is what everybody deserves and more. And then your power, really recognizing what are, the, what, are, what are your superpowers? What powers do you hold in addition to your voice and the education you receive and your influence, your networks? Really take a look at that and take inventory and see again, how you can use that for good. And then your privilege, it's a good thing. So make sure that you know your positions, your access, again, your network is something where you are using your privilege to advance, again, environmental equity, climate equity, climate justice, whatever you wanna call it. Um, you all are so positioned uh, to do and continue to do great things. So you know, what I will say is you can make change wherever you are. You know, I tell my daughters that um, you know, basically at six and eight, uh, they were uh, testifying uh, in many an environmental forum, uh, you know, on different climate issues and, and really air issues. And so they started young and they still do it to this day. Um, I want you to recognize that environmental and climate justice, it's not only a movement, but it's also an aspiration. So when we talk about environmental justice, that is the state where we want to be, kind of like liberation but it's also a part of the process. So remember, you know, bringing those principles of environmental justice and democratic organizing into not only how you do things, but also what your vision is for your community, or your country and your world. Um, last week, I had an opportunity to um, hear Trevor Noah speak at George Washington University, of course, virtually. And it, he says so many cool things and I love Trevor Noah, but you know, one of the things that I wrote down is that you can't expect everyone to be happy when you're speaking your truth. And so I just encourage you to stay true to yourself. And uh, sometimes you might lose friends or lose this or lose that, but that is okay. Because as long as you can look at yourself in the mirror and know that you did your best and spoke your truth within respect and with love, which I always say, um, you cannot go wrong. And then I encourage you just as you, I mean, you're in an exciting point in your life and I feel super old at this point, but I had like these intentions for my life after high school, like I was going to go be a chemical engineer for 30 years, retire, start my own magazine, and then do whatever I wanted. That did not happen. So I encourage you where you have like these dreams and things that you've written down that you want to do, 
I encourage you to be flexible, to remain humble, to always work hard and don't think the world owes you something, <laughs> but also have fun because life is too short to like be mad and disgruntled and not be in a place where you don't want to be. So with that, I will end and I look forward to the conversation and hopefully you all are still awake because I don't see any faces, but. Yeah, so we sometimes don't have our faces on because our internet is questionable from time to time. So with all of our video, that means we can't use audio <laughs> as well. So but, yeah, so we'll do our best to, you know, have faces, you know, we'll, yeah. Um, but know that it's just to maximize audio. Totally understand. Been there, done that, still going through that. <laughs> so let me see here. Oh, good. Yep. Miss Kennedy's and, and yep. Jamila, you ready? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm, my name is Jamila. I'll be representing Mr. Borak and Ms. Kennedy's advisory. And the first question that we have is, besides like institutional and internal racism, what do you think is like the number one thing that the United States struggles with when dealing with environmental justice? Hmm. I appreciate that question. And, and I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things, but I would really say, you know, acknowledging past harms and hurts. Because when you talk about healing, not only just from a personal perspective, but from the perspective of a nation, if you don't acknowledge what you've done in the past and you just think you can just kind of like go to the next thing and just move on, um, you know, that's, that's uh, a mistake. And so I think, you know, unfortunately our, our country uh, fortunately and unfortunately, is, is really, I think, dealing with many, many, many decades of, of racism and past harms. But we have to begin, you know, that acknowledgement not only has to come from the federal level, but it needs to, to trickle down to how states have managed or mismanaged environmental protection and safety, and then particularly our local folks. So I think that acknowledgement of past hurts and harms is critical. And that will be the thing that either keeps us from moving forward or actually propels us moving, uh, you know, at a, at a, I would say a faster trajectory than we would if we don't acknowledge and recognize that. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, I have a question here. the Maryland Department of the Environment? So I, I, I want to say Route 66 crew, I didn't hear your full question. So if you could repeat it for me, that would be awesome. What made you want to work for the Maryland Department of the Environment? Okay, I think you said, why did I want to work for MDE? Yes. Okay, all right, awesome, thank you. Um, so before, so I was actually living in Texas um, and my goal, and only you all can know this, was to become the administrator of the EPA one day. Like that was my dream. And so I wanted to do whatever I can to get closer to the East Coast. And so at that time I was in Texas, the EPA was on a hiring freeze <laughs> for a couple of years. But I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get close and Maryland got me there. So um, the Maryland Department of Environment was an opportunity for me to do a couple of things. Um, one, I was able to come into their air and radiation department as a public health engineer, which allowed me to work on not only kind of air quality type things, but uh, energy pieces, um, you know, like managing our, our fleet program. So uh, encouraging uh, folks to use compressed natural gas vehicles and hybrids versus, you know, regular combustion engine vehicles. So it, it, it comes so many different things. But what it also, I would say, afforded me is an opportunity to learn how government works or how it doesn't work. And while I was at the department, you know, my main job was this, was this public health engineer thing. But, you know, I'm a little bit nutty. And so 
part of the department, we had this environmental justice. Well, we had one person working on environmental justice. And so I volunteered to support the department manager for environmental justice. So I got a chance in my spare time to help conduct uh, statewide environmental justice dialogues, to help craft community benefits agreements for the state of Maryland. Um, I worked on there. I don't even know if they still have this. I think they do, but their sustainable environmental justice commission something communities. So it gave me that potential exposure as well to understand the, the plethora of issues going on around Maryland. And then I would say during um, the, oh my God, the legislative season, um, you had a chance to apply if you wanted to work in Annapolis and represent the department. And so I applied and I got a chance to actually represent our department with our legislative um, lobbyists down in Annapolis for a term um, which was amazing. So MDE being, end up being like just this awesome experience to learn about government, to, uh, you know, learn about kind of the whole lobbying thing, but then also, you know, what the challenges, the, the real, <laughs> real challenges that exist in government and, and why sometimes we don't see the protection that we deserve in our communities. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. To piggyback off of Jamila's question, we were wondering how you suggest we navigate the intersectionality between racial justice and environmental justice. Sure. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Um, racial justice and environmental justice both have their roots in racism. So, I mean, I, I would say in, in terms of navigating, I, I think it's acknowledging the source and the root cause of the problem and just making sure that whatever solutions that you offer, that, you know, it, it addresses that root cause. And so, you know, it, it's crazy because as you think about, you know, the issues that we are seeing, particularly in the environment space and the health space, I mean, it, it is all kind of like, everything is so connected. And I think it's even more obvious now to folks that, again, we can't really function in these like self-made silos um, because everything is connected. So I would say to, to your question, really recognizing that the root is the same for all these issues that we're seeing. And so how do you make sure that what you're doing is addressing the root and not just maybe the leaves that you see on the trees that, that, that are just the symptoms of the real cause of the problem? Mm -hmm. Hi. It's gonna, oh. hello. <laughs> I was going to ask, where do you see the environmental situation in 10 years? Oh, boy. I hope it's better than it is now. <laughs> I would say, you know, and I and I will tell you, I am probably, um, how do I say, I was tainted by D.C. Like, you know, I was really excited when I went to DC and you know I was on the hill lobbying and all this stuff and I'm like oh my gosh I'm gonna like change the world and do all this great stuff and you know what I learned very quickly is that there are so many forces that change the folks that we put the folks that we elect and put in the office there's so many drivers and forces that change their intentions you know, so they come to DC with good thoughts and good intentions. And then sometimes, you know, those get kind of sideswiped. <laughs> and so, um, you know, what I have, have learned is that really the change is gonna come um, from folks that are doing the work on the ground. And so my hope is that regardless of what happens at the federal level, and there's some, I mean, again, there is cause for excitement and energy at the federal level, no doubt. Like. The, the past administration, in my humble opinion, uh, it, it, you know, took us back, um, I don't even know how many years, right? So, I mean, probably this administration is going to spend more time fixing what was messed up. And so where I get excited and where I think we're going to see the most change and traction is at the local level and at the state level. And so... I do feel like the changes that my, my hope <laughs> is that we begin to see changes in, you know, 
investing in what matters. And if we haven't learned anything, we cannot afford not to invest in our public health infrastructure. Um, so I hope to really understand and, and see change in our investments in our public health infrastructure. That is critical because I truly don't believe that this will be the last that we see of any pandemic. Um, I think and I hope we see change in how we prepare and adapt for the impacts of climate change because that's not gonna go away. And so my concern is that the investments that we're making at the federal level will, will meet the same barriers that they've always met in getting monies and resources to the communities and places that need it the most. And so my hope, the change that I hope to see is that we are able to remove those barriers that keep those resources from flowing to places that really need it and not just the usual suspects that get all the monies. And when I say the usual suspects, I mean, there, there are cities and towns and places that know how to navigate the, the federal systems, the revolving loan funds, the grants and the resources. They know how to navigate because they have the, the capacity and the technical capacity to write grants, to fill out applications, to do all this stuff. And that's great. Right, but every place is not in New York City. Every place is not in LA. We have small to medium sized communities, rural communities that are experiencing the intensity of the same problems, but don't have the, the capacity and the people power and expertise to, to, to navigate these systems and get those monies and get those resources and funds so they can too, you know, live in a place that is comfortable and healthy and safe. And so I would say those are the two big changes that I hope to see, uh, you know, even before the next 10 years. So yeah, I, I could go on forever, but I would, I would, I'll leave it at that. Hi, I'm Ellie and I'm representing the Sage Ems Advisory. Um, when you were at Kresge, what was your task team's five-year, two-year, and one-year plan for honoring the principles of environmental justice in the U.S., and did that change with the presidential transition of power? You know, I would say as a foundation, I wouldn't say we necessarily had a, like a time plan to, to honor the principles of environmental justice, but I would say what we tried to do was in our grant making support organizations that embodied and lived out those principles of environmental justice. So, you know, probably, you know, when, when I got there five years ago and within this last year, um, as with many foundations and what you're seeing in philanthropy in general across the sector is that we're getting woke finally, right? You know, it's like all these years of damage, all these years of not supporting community-based organizations, frontline organizations, black and brown led organizations, women led organizations, indigenous led, you know, all these years. <laughs> now it's like, oh, you know, we have this, you know, we, you know, we, we've had this like, oh my gosh, we need to change what we do and how we do it. So I wouldn't say that, you know, we embody those principles, but we try to, I would say advance equity, which I think is aligned with the, the tenets and the purpose and, and the aspirations of environmental justice. Um, and we tried to do that in our strategy. We tried to do that in internally, like our processes and as an institution. And I say that because I was a part of our core team, our Kresge Operationalizing Racial Equity Team. Uh, and, and part of that was to understand our biases and our craziness going on. Because again, if you don't fix, again, the root of the problem, which in many cases, you know, you have, again, in some instances, program officers or folks, you know, giving out money that really don't understand and haven't connected to the communities that you're trying to serve, you know, and, and part of that is one, education, you know, experience, you know, how many funders have been community organizers or how many funders have worked for a social service agency. So I think what we try to do both internally um, with our hiring 
and our grant making strategies and even like our requirements for how people apply for grants that was often sometimes a barrier we try to to shift that and you know I, I think and my hope is that some of those shifts that we've made primarily that were heightened during COVID you know will not just be a COVID quick fix, but will be something that we adopt, and I'm saying we, something that Kresge will adopt long-term as an institution, just because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, again, I, I think, yeah, I'll stop there. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Awesome. I know it's getting close to time. But yeah. it, Yay, thank you. Yeah, for Mrs. Pleasant's advisory. Hi, Jonathan. All right, so uh, this is pretty simple. Uh, what can we do to help? <laughs> what can you do to help? Oh my goodness. So I, I, again, um, continue doing what you're doing. Like, you know, again, using your platform, your power and your privilege to educate folks on these issues. When you go home, when you have your holiday, hopefully holiday dinners, or, you know, you meet students from other places, like continue to educate and, and make those connections for folks around environmental health and justice. Um, you know, I think also where you have an opportunity um, where you can lend your kind of expertise and your skills. Um, there are so many community organizations, community-based organizations out there that are always looking for support or help or volunteers. So, you know, as time allows or, you know, um, you know, something to think about, kind of getting that experience to really understand, you know, what this means and what it means to community and, 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 um, how you can, you know, kind of further the mission of these great organizations that are always in need of, of assistance. Um, I would say on the other front, you know, as you, you know, matriculate and, and go to college and things of that nature and go beyond, you know, <laughs> what are the ways that you can begin to, I would even say, run for office and serve on local boards? Um, you know, because that is real. I am a firm believer in the power of like local and state leaders. Like that is where the rubber hits the road. So I would encourage you to, where there is an opportunity, um, begin to figure out what are my ways that I can be of service to my community. And maybe that's through leadership. Maybe that's through elected positions, volunteering, et cetera. There are you know, like I shared with you, there were so many issues that I didn't even know about right around the places that I grew up in Detroit. And it took me kind of going to another place to really see that. And so really focusing on, you know, how am I taking care of not only your family, but, but your community and, and what are the time, what's the time and talent resources that um, you can provide to kind of move on this broader issue of environmental justice and and really eliminating health disparities and, and, you know, eliminating racism. So that would be my suggestions. Thank you. No problem. Do we have one last question? <laughs> Hi, it's me again. Um, hey. How do you find hope and strength as you pursue justice and dignity in the face of climate change? Oh boy, gosh, I, I look at my daughters. Um, I look at the folks that have come before me and had just a different set of struggles. Um, I think about my mentors that have passed on, um, particularly um, Cecil Corbin Mark, who was the deputy director for We Act for Environmental Justice in Harlem, New York for many, many years and uh, recently passed away um, at the age around 50, but how his impact and legacy lives on. 
Um, I think about Mama Lila Cabell, uh, who uh, was a Detroit water warrior. And when the water was being shut off in all these communities um, and, and how she was just so humble, but widely respected and powerful. So I really think about like what folks have done before me and then my babies that I have to take, uh, take care of that are coming after me and are gonna inherit this place. Um, so that gives me hope, but also just because I, you know, I'm a firm believer, everybody deserves to be in a place where they can live, work, play, and pray um, that is healthy and that, um, you know, um, that shouldn't be, that, that, that aspiration shouldn't be contingent on, you know, what's on your W-2 at the end of the year or what zip code you live in or, um, you know, how affluent your community is. Everybody deserves um, to live in a place that is again, uh, not hazardous to their health is what I like to say. So that those things, past, the future, and you know, just that humility um, gives me hope. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. This has been a wonderful hour of conversation, education, um, and that we all have this ability. We all have within us strengths. Um, we all, I want us all to consider the people around us. And that's it, that we all want a place to work, uh, live, play, and pray. And, and when we all get to a point where we have safe places to do that, that's that's what we're, we're heading for. And so with Dr. Jalan White Newsom, with all of us on board, I thank you for spending the hour with us. I hope that you too have a great Earth Week and we will continue onward for more environmental and Earth Week programming. So have a great rest of your day and thank you again so much. You too. Thank you all so much and take care. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent.